So good afternoon. I am delighted to see you all here today. So who is the most prolific scholar in your discipline? How do you even go about introducing that person to a group of friends and esteemed colleagues? It is no easy feat. Admittedly, I am a Rich Mayer geek. Ever since first discovering his work, I have made it my personal mission to disseminate his research through my work in educational development and in my own classroom. I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Mayer last year at the American Educational Research Association annual meeting when I spotted him standing unaccompanied during a poster session. That fortuitous, or near stalking event, is what ultimately led to this talk that he is giving today. Dr. Richard Mayer is a distinguished professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and it is fair to say that he is one of the most productive and influential educational psychologists today. For the past 35 years, he has conducted research investigating the intersection of cognition, how people learn, instruction, how to help people learn, and technology, how to use graphics, video, games, and other forms of multimedia to help people learn. Among his many accomplishments, he received the Thorndike Award for Career Achievement for Educational Psychology, the Scribner Award for Outstanding Research in Learning and Instruction, and the American Psychological Association's Distinguished Contribution of Applications of Psychology in Education and Training Award. He has authored more than 500 publications and 30 books, including Applying the Science of Learning, E-Learning and the Science of Instruction, and Multimedia Learning. He is ranked as the number one most productive educational psychologist in the world in contemporary educational psychology. The primary reason the CELT team and I wanted to bring Dr. Mayer here today is that his work is remarkably relevant. Whether the technology that you embrace is the chalkboard or the online discussion board. He endorses the notion that instruction should be learner-centered rather than technology-centered, which means you must start with understanding the ultimate educational technology, the human mind. When instructional methods and supplemental technologies are used in a way that is congruent with how we learn, the result is a learner-centered, evidence-based approach to education. Dr. Mayer's work has tackled both the theoretical of how people learn and the practical, how to present material in a way that fosters learning. One of his most notable contributions is his theory of multimedia learning, which he will be talking about today in his talk entitled Designing Multimedia Instruction to Maximize Learning Online and Beyond. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rich Mayer. Thank you for that really lovely introduction, Kara. I really appreciate it. Too bad my dean wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I really appreciate the hospitality everyone has shown to me. And I appreciate the invitation, Kara and um, Kathy and Ellen. And um, it's just great to be here. Uh, um, I, some of you may know I'm, I grew up in Cincinnati, so I, I feel very at home here. It's very like it's like being being back home. I, I, we, uh, my wife and I actually are. Dri are driving across the country, so we started in California and we got to here, so this is good. Um, I'm r really glad to um, share with you today, and I hope you'll feel free to um, you know, interrupt me at any time and ask, ask questions. Hopefully, try to think of ones I might be able to answer, though. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, but just to give you a little background, my, my focus throughout my career really has been on trying to understand how can we teach in ways that will uh, help people learn so they can take what they've learned and use it in new situations. So this is basically the question of how can we teach for transfer? Um, and that's a very classic question both in psychology and in education that goes back more than 100 years in both disciplines. So. It's not a very original question, but I think it's a very important question for all of us who care about helping students learn. Over the last, say, 30 or 40 years, I think we have learned a lot about the science of learning. We know a lot about how learning works, and um, I think our job as educational psychologists is to see how can we take that and use it to understand how to help people learn. So that's what I'm trying to focus on here. How can we help people learn, especially learn in a meaningful way. So that's what I'm trying to do. So if I give a terrible talk, it just shows I 
don't really know what I'm talking about, I guess. <laughs> um, so I have to show you a picture of my campus. There, there, there it is. And did I mention it's like on the beach? Okay. <laughs> okay. I actually started there a long time ago. I thought I would stay a few years, but I guess it stayed more than a few years. Um, so what I really want to talk about today is our program of research that we've conducted over the last 35 or 40 years on um, how to design effective instruction based on our understanding of how the human mind works. Uh, I think instructional messages are often based on uh, good intentions, maybe expert opinion fads, sometimes ideology, um, testimonials, common practice. Th this is what we typically use, but I think we've now reached a point in our field that we can base it on um, scientific theory and evidence, so the science of instruction, the science of learning, and the science of assessment. Um, so what I really want to do is understand how can we design instructional messages that are based on evidence, grounded in the theory of how people learn, and actually produce the outcomes that we want. Um, so here are a lot of the uh, folks who have done the research with me. So these are the people who have done a lot of the work, so I'll just skip over that slide. <laughs> and, um, move on, and I actually left a bunch off, I, not I just noticed. Um, and just look at, I, I, some of you may know, early in my career I did a lot of research on advanced organizers. An outline really isn't an advanced organizer, but here it is anyway. So I just want to give you a brief introduction to kind of the um, science um, of learning and assessment and instruction. And then I want to spend most of the time looking at the research-based principles that my lab has come up with. Um, so I don't need this. So. Let me, I just want to show you a couple of um, PowerPoint slides and um, kind of get your opinion on kind of like what's wrong with them. So this is from a medical uh, um, venue, but what's wrong with this as a, an effective PowerPoint slide, would you say? Because it, it's using multimedia, and I, as some of you know, I'm interested in multimedia which basically means using words and graphics. So why is this not an effective multimedia graphic? Anybody have any? I can't read the words on it. Yeah, that's a problem. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not very empathetic to the learner since you can't, I can't read it from here either. <laughs> and I'm standing right in front of it. <laughs> Anything else wrong with it? Yeah. The graphic is totally irrelevant. I mean, it's talking about surfing through the bloodstream, but this is not surfing through the bloodstream. So somebody you know, pulled a cool graphic off the internet and put it on here, but it's irrelevant. So this is a not untypical, unfortunately. Um, here's another one that's um, intended for younger uh, learners. Um, what's wrong with this one? It's kind of showing the parts of the body and uh, parts of the digestive system and what they do. Yeah, there's a lot of words. Anything else? Yeah, it's hard to coordinate the words with the graphics. So like, you have to go, one is the mouth. Well, we kind of know where the mouth is, but say two, esophagus, you gotta look over and see that. So whenever you have a legend kind of situation, that violates a principle that I, I would call spatial contiguity principle. The word should be next to the part of the graphic they're talking about. Um, in this case, if you scan back, have to scan back and forth, you're wasting a lot of cognitive processing um, on something that's kind of useless. I'll look at one last one here. I guess it's obvious what's wrong with this one. Does anybody even know what this is about? Photosynthesis. Yeah, photosynthesis. That's great. This, this is a great test for, for people. Some people immediately know what it is and the rest of us go, what? <laughs> so this violates um, a number of principles. Certainly one of them is what I call coherence principle, which is to keep things simple. <laughs> this is not simple. Um, and also uh, what I call pre-training principle. If you're going to use technical terms, they should be defined in advance. This one, it's too simple. <laughs> um, so let me just briefly look at the science of learning. I, I don't want to spend too much time because I want to get to the principles, but I do want to give you a little bit of background. All I mean by learning, I mean the classic definition of learning it, is a change in knowledge due to experience. And so by multimedia learning, 
Um, I'm talking about a change in knowledge due to experience with words and graphics. So we're using words and graphics to try and change your knowledge. Um, and typically in education, that's what we have available to us, words and graphics. That's how we try to uh, design, th those are the elements in an instructional uh, message. Um, throughout the history of my field of science of learning, there have been three main conceptions of how learning works. One is what I would call response strengthening. This is the idea that learning involves strengthening and weakening of associations. This was the original theory of learning developed in the early 1900s. And in this case, instructors would um, basically give out rewards and punishments and learners would receive rewards and punishments. So I would ask a question, you would give an answer. If it was right, I would say right. If you're wrong, I would hit you. <laughs> that was the recitation method. And I'm not kidding. Um, in the early 1900s, that you either got hit or you got humiliated by having to wear a dunce cap and sit in the corner. So um, this was supposed to strengthen and weaken associations. It was based on the theory of the day. By the 1950s, the theory had changed to what I would call information acquisition, which is the idea that learning involves adding information to memory. So this is based on a computer metaphor. Uh, learners, uh, teachers are the dispensers of information. Learners are the recipients. So it's sometimes called the empty vessel view where the learner just doesn't have anything, just has an empty head there and you're filling it up with information. This is the person in the streets view of learning today. This is, this is how most people view learning. But a lot of the research shows us that that's not quite right, that people are a lot more active in learning. They're trying to make sense out of things. So there are a few problems here. If we had m more time, we could discuss this, but maybe in the, in the question and answer period. Uh, a slightly more recent view is what I would call knowledge construction, which developed maybe in the 70s and 80s and still is a uh, very uh, viable uh, view of learning. This is the idea that learning involves building mental representations. It's an active process. The learner is trying to construct something based on the input that is being provided. So learners are active sense makers and instructors are kind of cognitive guides that guide that sense making process. Does that make sense at all? Um, so an instructional method you might use if you were into response strengthening might be drill and practice. If you're into information acquisition, maybe textbooks or a lecture would, would fit into that view. And if you're into knowledge construction, maybe a discussion would be something that would fit into that view. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, I want to just take one second to look at what is active learning, because we're all in favor of active learning. We all agree it's a good thing. We just don't know, we just can't agree on what it is. Um, I want to argue that we're not really talking about behavioral activity. I mean, we can have hands-on learning that is completely ineffective or is effective. What we really mean by active learning is that the learner is cognitively active. They are processing the information. They're trying to make sense out of it. So what we're really looking for is cognitive activity. It doesn't necessarily have to be behavioral activity. Um, some of the main principles of um, how learning works that I have taken from the learning sciences are these, these three ideas. One is the idea of dual channels, that we have separate information processing channels for verbal and visual information. They're processed in different parts of the brain and they're qualitatively different in the way we represent them. Limited capacity is probably the number one issue we need to be concerned about in instructional design. And this is the idea that people can process only a small amount of material on each channel at any one time. So we can fill the screen with words and images and have all kinds of nice stuff going on, but people really can only process a very small amount of that at any one time. Um, and active processing, this is the idea that meaningful learning requires that the learner engage in appropriate cognitive processing. And by that I mean paying attention to the relevant information, mentally organizing it into a structure and relating it to their prior knowledge. Th those are the processes that we're really trying to prime when we're teaching. We want people to um, actively pay attention to what's important, organize it, and integrate it. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so, 
Cognitive psychologists always have a flow chart. So this is my flow chart. I think it's the only one I have uh, in this talk. So the idea is, and for some reason it always goes from left to right. <laughs> the world always moves from left to right. Um, so words and pictures, so we'll say this could be a textbook, this could be an uh, online lesson, this could be a game. It's coming, and so this is a multimedia presentation is coming in. It enters through our eyes or ears. So if there's a voice, it comes in through our ears. If it's graphics, it's coming in through our eyes. The little arrows that say selecting mean that we're paying attention. Some of that we pay attention to and get it into our working memory. In working memory, we can um, try and build a coherent structure. So that's what the organizing arrows are about. We build a, a verbal representation, we build a pictorial representation, and then the integrating arrow is where we try to put those together and also activate relevant knowledge from our long-term memory and connect it in with the incoming information. Does that make sense? Okay, so the arrows are really where the action is in, a, in a current theories of learning. We are actively paying attention to the relevant information, we're organizing it, and then we're integrating it with our prior knowledge. That's what we want to happen. So we want instruction that makes those things happen. Um, okay, so I, I won't belabor this anymore. We kind of have to, um, in terms of instruction um, and assessment, we always start with instructional objectives, a clear statement of the intended change in the learner's knowledge. Um, and in cognitive science, there are different kinds of knowledge we might want people to have. Facts, th these five categories are typical of the way cognitive scientists would analyze knowledge. Facts um, are kind of just the basic building blocks. Concepts, um, things like um, the concept of place value we might talk about. Procedures, which are step-by-step -step processes where the same input always gives you the same output. Strategies, which are kind of general methods for doing things. And kind of this last one is a more recent addition, beliefs, which are very important in education. Your thoughts about learning, like thinking about I'm not good at statistics, or I am good at statistics, or um, uh, if I work hard, I'll learn this. So these are beliefs you could have. So do these categories make sense to you? All right, um, in terms of measurement, um, the two traditional ways of measuring learning outcomes are a retention test and a or a transfer test. Retention just measures what you can remember transfer is an attempt to measure your understanding. It goes beyond the actual content and it asks you to actually apply it. Um, and these are three kinds of learning outcomes. Some, sometimes we have no learning, which is indicated by poor retention and poor transfer. Sadly, we see this in our students sometimes, right? Um, rote learning is kind of the signature here is good retention performance but poor transfer. So, so maybe you can recite back to me some of the brilliant things I've said, but you have no idea what I'm talking about. That would be rote learning. And then meaningful learning, this is where you would do well both on retention and transfer. Um, okay. I just want to look at three possible problems we can have in instruction. Um, maybe I should, um, well, I'll use these graphics, I guess. Extraneous, one, one problem is where we just have too much extraneous information. So maybe the slide is full of a lot of ex extraneous information like that surfer thing that had nothing to do with it. You spend all your effort looking at that, you don't have any um, cognitive resources left over to actually make sense of the material. Um, well, I guess first I should talk about these three types of learning before I go into that. So extraneous processing is processing irrelevant information. That's a, just a waste of your limited resource. Essential processing is processing aimed at representing the material. So that depends on how complex it is. If it's complex, it's going to take longer. Then generative processing, this is processing aimed at making sense out of it, reorganizing it, connecting it to your prior knowledge. So what we really want is people to engage in essential and generative processing and not um, um, extraneous. So I want to look at techniques for reducing extraneous processing because that, that's just a waste of our limited resource. 
managing essential processing, so when we have something really complicated, how do we get that across? And then fostering generative processing, how do we get people to tr want to make sense out of the material and put out the effort to do that? So that's kind of where Ellen comes in, with motivation. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so I'm, um, so my pitch here is I want to take an evidence-based approach here. Um, and most of the research that I'm looking at has a control group that gets standard instruction and a treatment group that gets the same instruction with one feature added to see if that feature helps you learn better. And then both groups take a transfer test. And the kind of metric of interest in learning outcome research or intervention research is effect size. I want to see how many standard deviations improvement do we get um, by adding this new feature. And um, I liked uh, an effect size of at least 0.4 because that tells me there's practical significance here. Um, it's, really, it's, it's enough to really boost somebody's performance. Does that make sense? Okay, so um, we do a lot of lab studies, some field studies, but we use kind of um, li little materials like this. I like to present this because this is the first real multimedia study I ever did, and I drew these myself. Us using a, probably, let's see how old people are, using a package called McDraw. Does anybody remember this? <laughs> yeah. Yep, one of the original, on the original Mac, it was, you could draw things like this. So anyway, so this is explaining how bicycle tire pumps work, which I thought would be interesting to UCSB students since they, we have a million bicycles, but they didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> so. I took these words from the World Book Encyclopedia when it actually was a print document, and, I, and then um, I made a graphic out of it that has a before you push the handle down and after you push the handle down. Um, I, we also made an animation which kind of has the same information in it. When the handle's pulled up, uh, the piston moves up, the inlet valve opens, the outlet valve closes and air enters the lower part of the cylinder. When the handle's pushed down, the piston moves down, the inlet valve closes, the outlet valve opens and air moves out the hose. So that's our presentation. Just takes a really a few seconds. Um, and this would be typical questions we could ask on a retention test. Just tell me all you can remember about how the bicycle tire pump works. Um, so I don't really care that much about those, but it's still nice to know. And transfer questions would be things like, um, uh, a redesign question, like how could you make the pump more reliable? I mean, that lesson does not have anything to do with how you would make it more reliable, but if you understand how it works, you might be able to figure it out. Or the third question here um, is um, a question, uh, uh, suppose you push down and pull up on the handle several times, but no, no air comes out, what could go wrong, what could be wrong? Okay, so that's, that's what I would call a troubleshooting question. And then lastly, a more conceptual question. Why does, the enter, why does the air enter the pump? Why does it exit? And you're supposed to invent the idea of a difference in air pressure because that's really what's causing it. So those are transfer questions because they're not really explicitly discussed, but if you understand how it works, you might be able to answer them. This is a passage on how lightning storms develop. I won't go through the gory details. Um, and this is an animation on lightning storms. We have the same kind of questions we can ask about transfer, um, um, what causes lightning, suppose there's clouds but no lightning, why not? Um, and this is a little lesson on how cars braking systems work, um, which I find, which I always find interesting now when I step on my brakes. Um, and these are some of the questions we could ask about that. I won't, I won't quiz you on this. Um, so let me kind of show you how I got started in this whole line of research on multimedia learning design. Um, I started with the idea that most instruction is based on words. That's kind of the typical medium we use in education. But what happens if we add graphics? Can that help at all? So I took this little paragraph from the World Book Encyclopedia about tire pumps, and really the only part of it that explains how it works is the part in italics here that I already read to you. Um, but here's the same information, but with graphics added. <coughs> so the question is, is that going to be better than the paragraph? Or here's a narration that, where the voice is saying this information, and here's an animation 
that in addition to the voice shows the graphics. Question is, does adding the graphics help? Here are some of the early studies that we did, nine different comparisons. The black bar is with words and graphics. The white bar is with just with words alone. And we're measuring percent correct on a transfer test. And you can see that in general, people are doing much better on a transfer test if we add graphics to the text. Even though we've explained it with the words, adding the graphics really helps people be able to use that information. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's kind of what got me started on what I call the multimedia principle, that people learn better from words and pictures than from words alone. Um, yeah. If you try it with just the pictures? Mm-hmm. They don't learn anything from just the pictures. <laughs> they have no idea. In fact, th some of them don't even know it's about a pump. So there's something about, so my idea is, there's something about integrating the words and pictures. The act of mentally doing that, you're constructing a really powerful knowledge um, representation. <coughs> yeah. So that was missing in your flow chart as well. I was kind of wondering about it. What is when it adds sounds to it? So if I actually have this sound to pop, does that change it once more? Yeah, that's a good, good question. We, we tried that in a few studies and we couldn't get um, sounds to do anything. We did it with our um, lightning passage. We, we added wind sounds and crackling sounds for the lightning. It didn't, it actually hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so it just might be our production ideas aren't very good. But it seemed like it was causing extraneous processing. People were focusing on those sounds rather than on the content. Anything that distracts you from the actual content maybe it's not a good thing, is the idea. Any other questions? Okay, so that's great. We have this multimedia principle, but the next step really is to figure out not, not all graphics are equally effective. So what really makes an effective graphic? Because we know that we can just pull something off the internet that's a graphic that looks cute, but it might not be helpful. So how should we do this? So these are five principles um, that are all aimed at reducing extraneous processing, which means we want to cut down on processing that has nothing to do with the instructional objective because working memory is limited when people use all their processing for representing and making sense out of the material. So first let me um, look at this first one, the coherence principle. Um, so here's a lesson, a uh, little text from a lesson on um, uh, how how a virus causes a cold. Um, so again, excuse me for my artwork. I drew these myself. They're not very good. Um, and here's the text. Um, kind of is explaining things. What we did was some people get this without the last two sentences and other people get it with these last two sentences that have interesting but irrelevant information, what are called seductive details. So I, we did a pre-study to see what details about viruses are interesting to UCSV students. This was the number one most interesting fact. Um, and <laughs> that the study revealed people who make love once or twice a week are more immune to colds than folks who abstain from sex. In fact, the things that are interesting to UCSV students had to do with, um, let's see, sex, <laughs> death, and filth. Those are the three things that are really interesting. Anything with numbers or anything like that was not interesting. <laughs> Um, so what we found is that adding those, in, so we had like six different slides, each one either had the seductive detail or didn't have the seductive detail. The one without seductive details was much more effective. People learned a lot better without having interesting details added than having those added because they're extraneous. They're not really showing you how a virus causes a cold. So in 23 out of 23 experiments like that, um, we're getting the same results. It's better to not add extra information. And the median effect size in those studies is 0.86. So that's telling us um, the good group is scoring 0.8 standard deviations better than the group that got this, the uh, seductive details. So that's a large, considered a large effect. Um, and here, if you don't believe me, here are all the studies. <laughs> um, I'll go. Um, the next principle, so that's the coherence principle, kind of keep it simple, which is 
what almost every expert would tell you in instructional design, but okay, now I have 23 studies that show you that. Um, does adding signaling improve learning? By signaling, I mean highlighting the important information. When it's in text, we can highlight it using headings, bold, font, color, arrows, all kinds of things like that. When it's spoken, we can do it by uh, voice stress. So this is a lesson on how um, airplanes achieve lift. I think of this every time I'm flying. It's just got to do with the shape of the wing. That's the only thing that's keeping you up. It just seems so odd. Um, so in this lesson, the, the signaling is just the voice saying, wing shape, curved upper su surface is longer. And then they would say, surface on top of the wing is longer than on the bottom. So that's how we signal. Other, in the non-signaled version, we're not <coughs> doing that. <coughs> in 24 out of 28 studies, adding highlighting of that sort, either by voice or in the text, um, improves performance on a transfer test with an effect size of 0.4. So if we can't eliminate the extraneous material, we at least should highlight the important material. Um, and here are all the studies that are looking at that. Um, this one is looking at the question of, if you have um, narrated animation, should we also add on-screen text? So should we have both spoken and printed words? So on the left, you're seeing uh, the light uh, slide from the lightning passage where the voice is talking about updrafts and on the right both the voice is talking about it and there's on the screen there's a caption that says the same thing as the voice. <coughs> what we find in 16 out of 16 experimental tests that we did people do better without the captions just having the, the animation and the voice is better than animation, voice, and on-screen text. Yes, there are exceptions to all of these and there are, there been, there's actually been some recent studies that show when the redundancy effect is violated. Actually, if the wording is different in the on-screen text or if, it, if it's shorter, then it helps. And it, even if the wording's different, that helps. And certainly, if there are kind of special needs issues, of course, also, Second language learners can benefit from captions. When there are technical terms, we have to have captions. So there are a lot of exceptions to these principles. These are not like written in stone. The, the, what's really written in stone is the theory of learning that involves you have to select the relevant information, mentally organize it, and integrate it with your prior knowledge. That's what we're trying to get across. We're just using these techniques to do that. Any other questions? Okay, <coughs> and so these are a bunch of the studies. Um, in this one, um, spatial contiguity principle we'll get to. One way of kind of explaining how brakes work is to show these two frames of before you step on the brake and after you step on the brake, what does the system look like? And then at the bottom, we have a caption that explains it. Or we can have an integrated presentation that has exactly the same two diagrams and exactly the same words, but now we have put the words next to the part of the graphic it's talking about. So when the driver steps on the car's brake pedal, that's next to the brake pedal. A piston moves forward in the master cylinder, that's next to the master cylinder. So we have just integrated the text and the graphics so that you know how they go together. Um, we can do the same thing with an um, animation. So here's an animation with a caption at the bottom or the words are next to the part of the graphic it's talking about. In 22 out of 22 tests that we did with a very large effect size greater than one, people learn better when words, printed words are placed next to the part of the graphic they refer to than when they are far away, such as, as a caption at the bottom. It's very typical, obviously, in, in textbooks to put captions at the bottom of figures. So that's not a good thing to do, <laughs> according, according to 22 out of 22 studies. So this is, I, I would say, if there's only one thing you get out of this talk, that I think that is one that I would, would emphasize because that's probably the principle I see violated the most, along with coherence, I guess. Um, does that make sense? Okay. Um, this one is looking at the, uh, if you have voice 
and graphics, should you present them at the same time or um, do the narration first and then the animation or vice versa? What our research shows is that it's much better to present uh, the voice and the graphics at the same time. The, the, wor the words that you're listening to should correspond to the graphics that are being presented on the screen. It's bad to separate them in time. So in nine out of nine tests, having simultaneous presentation is better than successive. So this, sometimes we have situations where you have to scroll on the screen. Um, that, could be, that could be bad if it's making you not look at the graphic at the same time the words are being spoken. Um, okay, so these are five principles for um, uh, reducing extraneous processing, um, coherent signaling, redundancy, spatial contiguity, and temporal contiguity. Let me look at three, so those are kind of getting at just clearing your system so that you can use your resources for um, productive processing. So let's look at what happens when we want to manage essential processing. Let's say we, we've eliminated all these extraneous things, but now we have something that's really complicated to present and it overloads our working memory just because it's so complicated. Three things we can do is to break it down into smaller parts, that's segmenting. We can provide some pre-training in what the concepts are, that's the pre-training principle, or we can use spoken words rather than printed words because the printed words are kind of cluttering up the screen. So here's an example of segmenting. Here's the lightning lesson. And after each little, um, maybe about 10 seconds of presentation, it stops and you have to click on continue for it to go on. So that's a form of segmenting. It allows you to digest one part before you move on to the next part. Doing something like that in 10 out of 10 tests greatly improve performance on a transfer test. So people are getting the identical information, but they have control over the pacing. That greatly helps people understand the material more deeply. Does that make sense? Okay. Sure. Does it matter what are the principles in the Because you could have broken that slide up in the middle if you wanted. So did you investigate that? In other studies, we've tr I better talk into this. In, in other studies, we've we've tried to look at what is a good segment. How, how big should a segment be? And I don't have a great answer to that yet, but I do know taking something that's long and complicated and breaking it into smaller parts helps. But how big each part should be is still an open question, I think. <coughs> so is this, are these principles for all times and all culture, or contemporary American culture and Santa Barbara at this time? I mean, 19th century Americans could sit and listen to an eight-hour speech with rapid and we can't do that today. We've lost that type of processing skill. <laughs> That's a really, that, that is a really good point. I love that. Um, so yeah, in EdSight, most of the research is coming from the, from the US, but there's an, in, an increasing amount of research from all over the world. So I, I think we're beginning to see how these um, ideas play out in other industrialized countries in, in uh, non-industrialized countries who don't have as much information, but um, they, do, they do seem to be holding up at least around the world and, uh, and other um, countries that have research universities. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's a difference between, it depends kind of on your goal. So if your goal is to instruct, you kind of have different principles than if your goal is to persuade or to entertain. So that I think it's a, um, the issues are slightly different. Educate. Yeah, instruct, educate. Yes, definitely, um, because um, prior knowledge we know is a huge issue in learning. It's probably the number one individual difference issue. So 
obviously older people probably know more than, than younger kids. Um, and also, um, as you get older, you're able to manage your working memory better, so you can, we can expect more processing to be able to go on. So yeah, I think age is important. So you're They might be. I find these principles are most important for people who have lack prior knowledge so, or inexperience, so I think that applies to young people. Most of the research is done with um, high school and college students, but there is some with um, younger. Okay. Um, okay, this is pre-training, so we have a little lesson on how the braking system works. We are, um, before the lesson, we can give people pre-training in the names of the parts, like what is a piston, what is a master cylinder, what is a wheel cylinder, and so on. Um, so if we compare learning, just watching the video, uh, watching the animation about how braking systems work versus getting the pre-training first in what those terms mean and then watching it, getting that pre-training in 13 out of 16 experimental tests help people learn, and the median effect size is 0.75. So again, a large effect by just making sure people know what the main concepts are before we try to explain how something works. Okay, um, and lastly here we have the um, uh, modality principle. So here's, again, let's say the lesson on how lightning storms develop. Um, we can either have the word spoken or printed. When they're printed on the screen, that can cause split attention because if you're reading the captions, you can't be looking at the animation. If you're looking at the animation, you can't be reading the caption. So you might miss something. If we can offload some of that um, visual processing onto the auditory channel, we can uh, effectively increase your capacity. So that's why we think narration would be better. And in 53 out of 60, this is the most studied one. In 53 out of 61 tests, um, it's better to have spoken than printed words if we're going to have a video or an animation. A lot of studies, I won't go through them all. Um, so these three principles kind of tell us how to deal with managing essential processing. Now I have two minutes to talk about how to get people to really process deeply, I think. Um, so for fostering generative processing, this is assuming that you've represented the material. How can we get you to really work with it, try to make sense out of it, reorganize it, relate it to your prior knowledge? One is the personalization principle, and the other is voice. So let me look at these. Um, personalization means using conversational language rather than formal language. And by conversational language, I mean really using first and second person constructions rather than third person. So this is coming from a lesson on how the human respiratory system works. So in the textbook it says, during inhaling the diaphragm moves down, creating more space for the lungs. Actually, we, we took this from eight different textbooks approved for use in California schools and two of them actually had it wrong. It says, um, <laughs> during inhaling, you inhale in, that forces your diaphragm down. <laughs> it's exactly wrong, really wrong. But, oh well, <laughs> that explains a lot about our test scores in California. <laughs> but anyway. In the personalized version, we just change the to your. During inhaling, your diaphragm moves down, creating more space for your lungs, enters, air enters through your nose, and so on. Um, just doing something as simple as using first or second person rather than third person um, improves performance. In 13 out of 17 experimental tests, and it, and it has a huge effect size, a large effect size. Um, so. I couldn't believe this when we first got it. My grads, one of my grad students thought this up. I thought, You're, this is never going to work. And then when she got it to work, I said, do it again. <laughs> do it again. But yeah, it works. Um, a voice principle is that people learn better from a friendly human voice than from a machine synthesized voice. So uh, even though um, there's a lot, we have a very good technology now for having computers generate voice, people still can detect it, and that detracts from learning in five out of six studies. Um, did you check the yes, we did check accent, and that does. Um, we, did, we didn't try British, but um, that's, the, that's what a lot of people think. And there's, 
Uh, we, we had someone with a Russian accent, and people definitely did not learn as well from that. <laughs> and I really felt bad, because it was an undergraduate, wanted to do this for her undergraduate research project, and she said, people never take me seriously because of my accent. And I said, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course they do. But <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> so I felt bad. <laughs> um, do I have time to go through a few more, or should I just stop now? A couple more. So let me just look at a couple of merging principles. One of them is what I um, call emotional design. So this kind of goes against um, the coherence principle that we should, we should take away extraneous information. Um, but here we have the, the lesson on how a virus causes a cold using just black and white line drawings versus color with the, the um, virus it is blue, it has facial expressions, the host cell has facial expressions. As the host cell gets infected, it kind of looks up there like, what? <laughs> and then the, the virus has very fierce um, facial expressions. So adding facial expressions is what I mean by, that's an, an implementation of um, emotional design. That actually help, helps learning. Um, so that's telling us we can add more detail if it directs your attention towards the point of the lesson. Adding cute little extra details that are irrelevant is gonna be distracting. But adding facial expression that is relevant helps. Let me look at one other one called embodiment. This is the idea that, let's say if we're gonna have an, an on-screen avatar, kind of, exp is, this one's explaining um, how solar cells work. If he just stands still and doesn't move, that hurts learning. But if he uses human-like gesture and um, facial expression, and movement, that helps learning. So the on-screen uh, agent has to kind of act, behave like a human, otherwise it's creepy. <laughs> um, and one other one here is um, we can either present information, um, graphics that are already drawn on the screen and then Celeste just explains them. This is the, about the Doppler effect or she can be explaining them as she draws them. So exact same words, same drawings. People learn better if they see her draw it as she's explaining it, rather than if it's already drawn. Um, same thing here. And the last one I wanna tell you about that has to do with embodiment is if we're gonna have a video showing, let's say in this case, how to um, put a circuit together on a circuit board, People learn better from a first person perspective, so it's like your hands are out there, than from a third person perspective where you're looking across the table at the person. So it's the same information, but there's something about it being in the first person that helps people better. Most YouTube videos that you've probably watched are from third person, so we have to go back and redo all this. <laughs> um, so those are the principles. I'm sticking with them. Um, and th this kind of summarizes a lot of the work that my lab and other labs around the world have done. And it, you know, it, it's just taken a lot of years to do all of this. It seems like we should have more for all, all this time. But what I like about it is it shows we can actually come up with evidence-based principles grounded in theory that are relevant to how we should design instruction even at the college level. So um, my kind of take home message is um, there is an empirical research base that we can use, that we can draw on when we're, when we're trying to design online instruction. So thanks for your attention. Now we have some time just for a general Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, one over here. Thank you. Um, so, you cited, I know, hundreds of studies, but is there a norm in these kind of studies in the time lapse between when you expose students to the information and when you're testing their attention? That, hello? Oh. <laughs> Darn, now you can actually hear me. <laughs> um, I, that's a really good question because most of these studies are short term studies with an immediate test. And, and we know that. Really, if you want to test for understanding, you should have a delayed test, because that, that, that's a better indication of understanding. So some of these studies do have delayed tests, but most of them are immediate. And there, there's a lot of research that shows sometimes things shift. 
you get a good result on a media, but then not the later, vice versa. So the, I think you, you've touched on really. I was thinking issue. of the seductive details, <laughs> uh -huh. where maybe they don't have a short term impact. But I can imagine some students six months later, all they remember are the seductive details. <laughs> we, definitely, we definitely get that even on the immediate test. And we say, please write down all you can remember. Yeah, they remember the seductive yeah. details. Yeah. That's, a, that's what, what they should get out of it. I'm a music teacher and we use a lot of movement. And I was wondering, would you consider that to be a separate mode to the verbal versus and the pictorial? Or is it more of an embodiment? Um, yeah, I, I think you know, theories of embodiment are most relevant. But unfortunately, that's the most underdeveloped theory we have. It's kind of a kind of nebulous idea right now in cognitive science. I think we, we do think we use our body to think with and to learn with. And, um, and when you're doing any kind of performance learning, I think things like self-reference are important. So I mean, I always think of things like, oh, my wife and I took um, dance lessons. And you always have the instructor up there and you here <coughs> facing them. But then we went, took a class where the instructor stood the same way we were. And we just, we were kind of all going in the same direction. We learned much better from that. Now I understand that's that's because of first person versus third person perspective. So I, I think some of these principles are relevant to performance learning, but obviously not as developed. Could both be a reflection of limited uh, bandwidth, uh, learner uh, resources? For example, from with, when you're watching a third person perspective, you have to use resources to sort and change your perspective. Um, because the person that's talking to you is talking from, of course, the first person perspective. Likewise, when somebody is describing the process, um, they do it slower than when um, the diagram is already up there and they're simply going through the narrative. And again, the first example in the description of the process would be a slower delivery and a respect for the limited learner resource. Right. This is like, I think, in terms of cognitive processing, the number one issue that we come up against in instructional design is like, how do we get people to engage in the processing we want them to engage in, given that they have a very limited capacity for processing? So short-term memory or short-term processing is very limited. So how do we get them to do what we want them to do? That's, so I think you're absolutely right. And having to translate from one perspective to another is wasting some of that resource. I think sometimes people don't um, create these kind of graphics because they feel like they're not gonna look super professional. Do you have any comment on a research about how the professionalization or you know avoiding ums and things like that, editing those out, how does that affect yeah. Uh, learning? Yeah, there's a long history of research on illustrations that's really interesting. It kind of shows that very simple line drawings, just black and white line drawings. One of the original studies looked at the human heart. It's more effective in explaining how the human heart works than very detailed drawings or even photographs. <coughs> photographs were the worst. So sometimes having very realistic graphics is actually not a good idea because there's just too much detail in them. If you just want to explain, say, how the human heart works, just a line drawing that shows the chambers and the valves. That's what you want to get across. That's all should be in there. So, yeah, I don't. I don't think it's the production quality that's important. It's the psychological emphasis, being able to point out what are the main parts we want people to see in it. That's that's what's important. I wonder if you could comment on how the chalkboard has been replaced by PowerPoint. Yeah. Um, I saw you use PowerPoint. I do in talks because that's the standard and we all expect that and there is certain efficiency with PowerPoint, but I much prefer, personally, talk and chalk. My students, on the other hand, <laughs> oh, here's what they want. <laughs> I'm only kidding. In my classes, it's about 50-50, but I think they're humoring me, the ones that say they like talk and chalk. They just don't want to hurt my feelings. Um, but life but, is but, not the issue. The issue is... How does it help them learn? Exactly. I'm trying to point out to them, hey, look, I showed them this research study uh, that I showed you with Celeste, either writing it or 
had already drawn that it's better if I talk and draw at the same time. See, there's a study that shows that. They go, right, okay. <laughs> but I do think the evidence shows, at least from the, we have a long series of studies along those lines that, sh that show this. So I think there is some evidence for actually physically drawing as you're explaining. Power, and, uh, I think the real problem with PowerPoint slides is people don't design them well. So it's very easy to um, put too much information on PowerPoint slides, too many words, too much complication. Each slide should just have one point, should just have a clear heading, uh, should have a graphic and text, but not too much text. And it, sh it should be obvious what the point is. Then you can use words, to f you can use your voice to fill it in. It doesn't make sense to read the slide to people. But that's what a lot of a lot of us do. Yeah. I'm interested in the uh, pictures and words from a different twist. Have you done any studies where you train the students to use mental imagery? So what is occurring then? Uh, the pictures are being provided, generated by them. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a fantastic idea. So, I um, we've looked at. I would consider that what I would call study strategy. So I, I have a book, um, my former grad student, um, Logan Fiorello, called um, Learning as a Generative Activity. We look at eight different learning, what I call learning gen generative learning strategies, and imagining is one of them. So the idea here is, we'll give you a text, like for example, a text on how the human heart works, it's a typical thing we use, um, and ask people um, for each page to imagine an illustration that would go with this text. So it's talking about the chambers of the heart. So just imagine the illustration. We even give them a place. Like, it's right here. What, what would that look like? That greatly improves their learning, which which really blew my mind. I, I, I did not expect that. Um, and we've replicated that with a bunch of other studies. So I do think what I call the imagination principle, there's evidence that that is an effective learning strategy. The problem with it is you need training and how to do it. A lot of students don't know exactly how to do it, and they need guidance. So when you just say imagine, it doesn't help. But when you say, oh, visualize the, the four chambers of the heart and these two valves, then they can do it. So they need a little more direction than what to imagine sometimes. Okay, follow-up to a question before about the pictures. Um, lighting on the board. Uh, in those video studies, the zoom in uh, video, where it just shows the hand during the drawing, perform better with higher and lower prior knowledge folks, uh, rather than full body. Were the effect sizes about the same, or? I think so. And it's just one study, you don't get that worried about the effect size, but I think it's about the same. Okay. So the, the important element, apparently, is the hand itself. Seeing, seeing a hand, seeing the hand draw is, is important. You don't have to see the whole arm, you don't have to see the whole body, just the hand. In mentioning the concept of having simple drawings versus photographs, etc., in patient handouts, we learned this the hard way. We did these wonderful video clips, we had these wonderful pictures, we had these wonderful photographs all put together, and we then looked at patient compliance and it sucked. <laughs> And we compared it to a group that received hand-drawn, stick men, laughed at our inability to draw. <laughs> Compliance was significantly better in those. Yeah. So they're more simple. simple. They're more understandable because they're focusing your attention on what you want them to do. <coughs> yeah. I, I have some curiosities about the future in terms of AI. I have lots of curiosity about the future web. In terms of using AI with, with um, learning. Mm -hmm. And your kind of study about the uh, robotic voice versus human voice, mm -hmm. do you see that changing as as they become a little more indistinguishable from one another? That might. I mean, at some point, probably, well, the machine voices will be just so good, they might be better than our voice. I, I don't doubt that that's eventually going to happen. Those studies with the voice were done a while ago. I think, um, yeah, on an old Mac, using the, the voice called Bruce. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I think maybe that voice principle will go away once we get that voice. But anything that reminds you that it's a machine 
tends to diminish learning. So even things like um, if you have your if you have to have earphones on, it's better if they're not connected by wire. Because then, then you're not as aware of what this is a machine. And it's little subtle things like that have an effect that you never would have thought of. Um, at your university, do you have a mechanism for instructors to run their teaching tools through some specialist like you? <laughs> yeah, they call me. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to them. It's usually um, instructors who have developed these fantastic um, instructional um, <coughs> devices that they use in their classrooms, um, and then they want me to like bless them. Or something. <laughs> Did I follow your principles? <laughs> and, I have to, and it's so hard to tell. I mean, there's so many different you know dimensions of how they could have done it, but. Uh, I guess your the answer is no. <laughs> but I'm always glad to, to talk to people. And I've met a lot of really fun faculty. Uh, people are really interested in uh, developing instruction, which is sometimes rare to use research university. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you mean if you're going to have a lecture? Yes. <coughs> um, well, like in that um, Doppler like study, it seemed like it was better to, to draw it even though it was hand drawn and didn't look that good. So we need more research, but I think it's not it's not the production quality that's that important. It's the having the elements in it that we want people to focus on. We want to direct their attention to the important parts of it. Well, if there are no more questions, we will uh, conclude this event. We have some coffee and snacks outside, and we'll have a brief reception if anybody wants to chat with Dr. Mayer for about 30, 45 minutes.